Kepler had studied Chinese at the Australian National University and took first class honours. He went on to serve many years in the Australian Foreign Service. He then became active in Labour Party politics in Queensland, became member for the seat of Griffith in 1998, and quickly moved on to the front benches. He became leader of his party in 2006, and next year defeated the long-serving Prime Minister John Howard to become Prime Minister of Australia in a landslide victory. He served as Prime Minister for three years after that, then as Foreign Minister until 2012, and then returned for a period as Prime Minister in 2013. He became known for many specific policies. Uh, one of his first acts was the sorry to the Aboriginal peoples of Australia. Uh, he also was urgent in his addressing of climate change. But above all, for this evening, we want to stress that he managed to develop and bring forward to a new level the Asia-Pacific identity of Australia, particularly in terms of its dealing with China. Although one imagines, Kevin, there were some occasions when the Chinese may have wished your, your Mandarin was not quite as fluent as it actually was when you were telling them what you thought about certain of their policies. In China, he's known as Lu Kowen, and he, he remains known for his informed and sometimes forthright views on how the West and China will need to deal with each other. Since leaving the Premiership, he's taken a variety of leadership roles, including as the inaugural president of the Asia Society Policy Institute based in New York. He chairs the Independent Commission on Multilateralism and is also currently in charge of the Sanitation and Water for All Global Partnership. Yep, I've got a glass of water for you there, so just making sure that we're doing our parts on, uh, on that. He has roles at Harvard, Chatham House, and Paulson Institute in Chicago. Tonight, he's speaking on perhaps one of the most urgent issues for the next US president, whoever she or he may be, um, on the future of US-China relations under the next administration and whether there's a solution to the North Korean nuclear question. So may I ask you to welcome our speaker tonight, the president of the Asia Society Policy Institute and the 26th Prime Minister of Australia, the Honourable Kevin Rudd. Well, thanks so much, uh, Rana, for the kind introduction. It's good to be back here in Oxford. I've been here a number of times before. First time I've seen this centre. It's a great university, that goes without saying, but this is becoming a great centre by global standards, for which those of you associated with it should be congratulated. Um, as Prime Minister of Australia, I tried to do something similar um, for the centenary of Australia's capital, Canberra, when we established the Australian Centre on China and the World at the Australian National University. I think what unites us all in what we might describe as the new Sinology is how in fact we seek to provide an integrated view for policymakers and the world at large of this new phenomenon called global China. As I've said many times, China has been a great power throughout most of its civilizational history. China very recently has become a global power and this for all of us is a new phenomenon. And therefore, the analytical heft which we bring to this task is one which uh, will be valued by the policymakers of today and tomorrow. So I congratulate this centre and the work that it's doing. Last year, I released a report, having spent uh, a year in political exile at Harvard. Uh, in the 2013 Australian elections, I came second. Uh, <coughs> usually cheers us up when we say we come second. <coughs> I didn't lose it, I just came second. <laughs> um, but I spent a year working with Harvard colleagues on this single question, can, could we provide a strategic narrative which was acceptable in Beijing and Washington for the future of the US-China relationship? I released a report which was entitled US-China 21, the future of US-China relations under Xi Jinping. And within it, I recommended a new strategic narrative which I called constructive realism as a principle to guide this relationship into the future. I sought to deal with the absence of an agreed strategic narrative between China and the United States. I, um, as you know, both these countries have narratives against each other, usually privately held and occasionally publicly articulated, uh, but there is no common narrative between them as to what world they could or should sh seek to shape together. And that uh, caused me to reflect on that question for a good year or so. Now let me draw on some elements of what I had to say back then. Both Chinese and American foreign security policy practitioners uh, pride themselves on their hard-nosed realism. In the case of the Chinese, inspiration of course is drawn from Sun Tzu, uh, Sun Tzu Bingfa, 
and other authors of the so-called uh, seven military classics, the Wu Jing Qi Shu. For Americans, it's a cocktail of Clausewitz, uh, E.H. Carr, and Morgenthau. There is no great Chinese philosophical school, perhaps with the exception of the Maoists, though they didn't last very long. Mordza was one of my fun subjects at university, but he didn't really survive beyond the fifth century BC. So there is no great enduring or surviving Chinese philosophical school to draw upon that is remotely equivalent to either the idealists or the liberal internationalists in Western international relations theory. For these reasons, for any strategic framework to be regarded as credible in either Chinese or American eyes, despite their radically different historical experience, a realist recognition of the fundamentally different and in some cases actively conflicting national interests between the two is essential. The list of such contested areas in US-China relations uh, is relatively long, but in my argument, not insurmountable over time. A healthy exercise to be conducted in both capitals would be to identify which of these core interests, Khe are actually uh, incapable of being solved. My list, of course, is purely indicative. Number one, Taiwan, including future American arms sales. Number two, conflicting claims between China and Japan in the East China Sea, uh, Senkaku Diaoyudao. Uh, conflicting claims uh, between China and other claimant states in the South China Sea. Um, fourthly, the retention of US alliances in Asia. Uh, fifthly, China's military modernization and mutual surveillance of each other's capabilities. Six, acceptance of legitimacy of the Chinese political system in the United States as a matter for the Chinese people themselves to resolve. And seven, the management of bilateral, NGO and UN multilateral disagreements on human rights, basic freedoms, including unit, uh, internet regulation. This I would regard as seven core, quite fundamental <coughs> conflicting national interests. These disagreements should not be seen as no-go areas in the relationship, rather they should be acknowledged clearly as major difficulties, but they should not be allowed individually to derail the entire relationship. Even dire circumstances such as major crises would warrant direct communication between the two presidents to explain to one another why it is necessary to imperil the entire relationship. These choke points in US-China relations, as difficult as they are, can be managed, I argue, through a common strategic framework and with common political will. However, I argue that these deep realist elements of the relationship should be matched by constructive engagement, constructive engagement between the US and China in difficult areas, but not insurmountable areas, uh, both bilaterally, regionally, and in terms of their global relationships as well, where true progress might actually be possible. Otherwise, there's a danger that unalloyed strategic realism will suffocate the relationship altogether. Or worse, given the generally bleak assumptions about each other's ultimate strategic intentions, there is the perennial risk of hyper-realism becoming a form of self-fulfilling prophecy, resulting in crisis, conflict, or even war. That's why in the report that I did for Harvard, I argued for an approach of constructive realism, accepting the realist constraints from the relationship agreeing on management mechanisms for the inevitable tensions that arise from such constraints, as well as advancing areas of constructive engagement that can incrementally build strategic trust over time, step by step. Bilaterally, this con could include the conclusion of a US bilateral investment treaty, the so-called BIT, could include <coughs> agreement on a joint strategy and joint intelligence task force to deal with terrorism in the region from Afghanistan to Xinjiang. The elaboration of a full set of military transparency measures and protocols for the management of unplanned military incidents, building on those agreed to in November of 14. An agreement on a process, for example, for Chinese and American uh, ratification um, of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, CTBT, noting that Russia is already a ratification state and that China's position is that it would ratify if the US Congress allows the United States administration to ratify. I've also argued for a strategy of, strategy of constructive realism in the region, the Asia-Pacific region. Here we have a cocktail of fragile, fragile regional relations, fractious great power relations, and a growing arms bazaar, making Asia an increasingly dangerous neighborhood. Combined military budgets in Asia in 2014 for the first time exceeded those in Europe. This is new. <coughs> 
But here is an indicative list um, only of where strategic trust could be built between China and the United States within the region at large. As I argued at the time in this report, number one, the development of a joint strategy on the denuclearization and peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula. This would necessarily involve security guarantees to the north under whatever unified regime might replace it and would also necessitate negotiations on the future of any continued US military presence on the peninsula in the event of denuclearization <coughs> and reunification. Two, a joint initiative to harmonize in time the TPP and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, and FTAAP, Free Trade Area for Asia and the Pacific, so that the region does not grow into different conflicting trading blocks that reinforce rather than reduce existing geopolitical tensions and alignments. And thirdly, the development of a concept paper on the long-term evolution of an Asia-Pacific community, what I call an APC, Yatai Gongongti, in order to encourage habits of regional cooperation around a concept of common security, which I argued further in the report at large. It is within this framework of constructive realism, both bilaterally but in particular regionally, that to this evening I want to examine further what could and should and might happen on the core strategic question of the North Korean nuclear program. Much global tension is focused today on Ukraine, Syria and cyber security. So it should be. During the next US administration, North Korea will be the principal national security preoccupation of the United States. And so it should be. North Korea is not just a regional security challenge in Northeast Asia. It's not just a regional security challenge for the Asia Pacific region. It is a challenge to global peace and security. And there are five reasons for this. First, the rapid advance in North Korean nuclear weapons technology and ballistic missile systems. Second, <coughs> these systems will have a global, not just a regional reach. Third, the declaratory policy of the, is there some gin in that? I'd like that. Um, the, uh, third, the declaratory policy of uh, the North Korean regime is that they threaten to use these weapons against the ROK, Japan and the US, to use these weapons. Fourth, if there were a war on the peninsula, including one involving nuclear weapons, the impact on global security and the global economy would be of a scale of magnitude exceeding all post-war crises in terms of loss of life, physical destructive potential, economic destruction, and the outflow of refugees. And fifth, there is at present no diplomatic mechanism engaging the DPRK, DPRK regime on this matter, none at all. These are five ingredients for a potentially global disaster exceeding all post-war crises. As most of you know, this is a question the international community has wrestled with utterly unsuccessfully for over two decades. In fact, the situation on the Korean Peninsula has become more dire over the past several years, and especially so since Kim Jong-un, a relatively young, experienced and unknown leader, has taken over the reins of power and with brutal effectiveness. In contrast to the successful diplomacy that led to the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, the so-called six-party talks between the DPRK, the ROK, Japan, China, Russia and the United States have now been stalled for almost a decade. Over the last decade, the North Korean regime has not only continued to advance its nuclear program, it's accelerated its pace of development, testing and preparations for deployment. While multilateral diplomacy and international sanctions will certainly be an element of any plan, I would argue the key variable needed to deal with the DPRK is a new level of strategic engagement between the United States and China, and a problem which has the capacity radically to impact their core national interests and the future of their relationship. As the world's two largest economic and military powers, leaving of course to one side the nuclear capabilities of the Russian Federation, the US and China have a potential in terms of their bilateral cooperation to deal with this problem, ultimately to solve it, but the question of course is how. Let's look for a moment at the current state of the uh, North Korean nuclear program. Let's reflect for a, for a few minutes on, its, on the essential nature of the technical problem. The DPRK has now conducted five nuclear tests in 06, 9, 13 and 2 in 2016. And while there is much we do not know about the status of the DPRK's nuclear program, uh, it's clear that its capabilities are becoming stronger and more sophisticated. The past month's test 
appears to have been the biggest one to date with an estimated yield of 10 to 30 kilotons. To put that in perspective, the city of Hiroshima was leveled with a 15 kiloton bomb. While we know their program is advancing, there are still several important questions about the status, the actual status of the DPRK's nuclear program. First, there's an open question on how much fissile material the DPRK now possesses and how much that is increasing by each year. The most recent estimate by Dr. Siegfried Hecker, a leading expert on the DPRK's nuclear program, is that North Korea already has a stockpile of between 32 to 54 kilograms of plutonium and is able to enrich uranium at a rate that could produce up to six additional weapons per year. In total, he assesses by the end of 2016, North Korea will have sufficient fissile material for 20 nuclear weapons. A recent RAND report uh, provided an even more worrisome estimate, placing the current size of the North Korean arsenal at between 13 and 21 weapons, and assessing that by 2020 this number could jump to a total of 50 to 100 weapons. Second, the DPRK claims that its January 2016 test was a hydrogen bomb. International experts first cast doubt on this assessment, but now believe that it could indeed have tested at least elements of a hydrogen bomb. The significance of this achievement is that it would suggest that North Koreans are mas mastering nuclear fusion technology, which would potentially provide them with the capacity to de detonate a far more powerful device than simple fission. To explain, nuclear fission uh, devices or atomic bombs are what most of us associate with nuclear weapons. An atom is split, thereby releasing a large quantity of energy. This is the type of relatively simple atomic weapon we first saw deployed by the United States in World War II. By contrast, nuclear fusion devices, known as hydrogen bombs or th thermonuclear weapons, produce energy by fusing atoms together, thereby causing an exponentially larger release of energy. For example, while the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima yielded an explosion equivalent to 15 kilotons of TNT, the United States' first test of a hydrogen bomb in 1952 yielded an explosion of approximately 10 megatons. 15 kilotons, 10 megatons. It's a big difference. To put this into stark perspective, a smaller 10 kiloton bomb detonated over uh, Seoul would kill almost 80,000 people and likely injure over a quarter of a million additional people. But a high yield weapon, such as a one megaton yield, would produce something along the lines of over 1.5 million dead and almost 5 million injuries. Weapons of mass destruction are called that for a reason. The destruction is mass. A third important unknown is the DPRK's source material. Are they using plutonium or, or uranium for the devices they are testing? A successful test using enriched uranium would indicate a significant leap forward in the DPRK's program. Whereas pl plutonium stocks for them may be finite, uranium enrichment could allow the DPRK to build an infinite stockpile of nuclear weapons. Additional uranium enrichment is much easier to carry out in secret making it simpler to hide the status of their program from the international community. Recent commercial satellite imagery confirms that since 2013, North Korea has undertaken a significant refurbishment of the Pyongsan uh, uranium <coughs> enrichment plant. And in September 15, the director of the DPRK Atomic Energy Institute confirmed that all of the Yongbyon facilities, including the nuclear enrichment plant and reactor, had been restarted as of 2013. A fourth question concerns the status of DPRK delivery systems. To have a successful nuclear program, North Korea must be able not only to produce and successfully detonate a nuclear bomb, they must have the ability to deliver it via missile technology to its intended target. The majority of these are short and medium range weapons that are of most concern to North Korea's neighbors in Seoul and Tokyo. And there are about a thousand of them. Their range is up to 3000 kilometers. But what is now worrying many in the international community is that North Korea appears to be actively seeking the capacity to produce an intercontinental ballistic missile, an ICBM, that could strike continental the United States or even the European continent. Furthermore, the pace of North Korea's missile testing has once again accelerated of late. There have been concerns for many years that North Korea might be seeking an ICBM, but the first real confirmation this arrived in 2012, when North Korea displayed what is known as the KN-08, or the Hwasong-13, in its annual military parade. The US Department of Defense assesses that if successfully designed and developed, these missiles could strike the continental United States. But in March 16, the Pentagon confirmed that the DPRK had developed a new road mobile ICBM called the KN-14, a long-range variant of the KN-08. 
or as one US official said, it's the KNO8 on steroids. Fifth, North Korea has also been working on developing a submarine launched capability, as we may have seen in tests in both November 15 and September 16. And its repeated testing of new road mobile and submarine launch variants make clear that the DPRK wants to develop capabilities that are harder to, to detect and harder, therefore, to attack. Finally, what progress in miniaturisation? Although the DPRK claimed after its most recent nuclear test on September 9 that it now possesses the ability to successfully mount a warhead onto a missile, the validity of this claim remains an open question in the expert community. At various points in time over the past few years, individuals with the US government have suggested the DPRK does in fact possess the ability to miniaturise a nuclear weapon. Most notably, the commander of US forces Korea, General Curtis Scaparotti, stated in 2014 that he assessed the DPRK had, and I quote him, the capacity to have miniaturised a device at this point, and they have the technology to potentially deliver uh, what they say they have. I don't think as a commander we can afford the luxury of believing perhaps they haven't quite got there, unquote. At the same time, Admiral Bill Gortney, commander of the US Northern Command and NORAD, reaffirmed this assessment in 2015, noting in testimony to the United States Senate Armed Services Committee that, and I quote him, our assessment is that they, the North Koreans, have the ability to put a nuclear weapon on a KN-08 and shoot it at the homeland, unquote, meaning the United States. However, the official US position remains somewhat more circumspect. With the Pentagon refusing to confirm uh, Gortney's assessment and emphasise that North Korea has not yet demonstrated the capacity to miniaturise uh, a nuclear uh, bomb for the purposes of putting it on the end of a missile. Therefore, we do not have firm evidence that North Korea has successfully thus far miniaturised a nuclear weapon, and we also lack evidence, however, that they have not done so. Prudence would suggest that perhaps we should err on the side of assuming the worst. There can be no doubt, however, about the DPRK's strategic direction. You don't do all these things without the intention which I have been describing. Based upon the information uh, that I've just outlined, US military commanders clearly believe North Korea is extremely close if they have not already succeeded in miniaturising nuclear weapons. In summary, therefore, we face, therefore, a North Korea with growing fissile material stocks and at least capable of producing 10 nuclear bombs. And there is a growing census that North Korea also is developing atomic and hydrogen bomb capabilities, which would imme immeasurably enhance their destructive potential. Third, it is drawing upon both plutonium and enriched uranium for its nuclear program, giving the DPRK a limitless stock of nuclear material. And fourth, that it possesses a missile program which does include ICBMs and possibly SLBMs and mobile launchers, which are harder to identify as targets for attack. And finally, that their miniaturisation program is either successful or on target to be so. So what have been the international reactions to the above? Of course, over the last two decades, the international community has repeatedly come together to condemn and to attempt to halt the DPRK's nuclear and fissile programs. There have been a total of four UN Security Council resolutions on this, each with progressive levels of intensity leading up until the most recent test this year, on which the, the UN Security Council continues to deliberate. The bottom line, however, is that each of these resolutions and the range of sanctions and related <coughs> measures that they have announced and agreed to as a council, including both the Russians and the Americans and the Chinese, have produced not one jot of change in North Korean nuclear behaviour. In fact, during this period of time, North Korean nuclear behaviour has intensified. So what are the national positions from surrounding states on the North Korean program? Well, it's wise, I think, to start with the DPRK itself. What are these guys up to? What are they seeking to achieve? Always a useful question to ask in international relations. <laughs> on the 8th of January, in a statement on the official KCNA news, they said, quote, history proves that powerful nuclear deterrence serves as the strongest treasured sword for frustrating outsiders' aggression. It went on to state, quote, the Saddam Hussein regime in Iraq and the Gaddafi regime in Libya could not escape the fate of destruction after being deprived of their foundations for nuclear development and giving up nuclear programs of their own accord." Unquote. In other words, the North Korean program is seen in Pyongyang as a sine qua non for regime survival. 
Therefore, any diplomatic effort aimed at halting the North Korean program, let alone destroying the current stock of nuclear material, has to deal fundamentally with the North Korean basic demand for regime survival. We should assume that North Korea, like any actor in international affairs, is fundamentally concerned with its own survival. We've seen that throughout history. It's a robust principle. Within this prism, the DPRK then puts forward three core demands. First, the DPRK routinely demands the signing of a peace treaty with the United States, formally ending the state of war that had continued to exist since, has continued to exist since 1953. Second, experts with some ex access to Pyongyang suggest that some type of external security guarantees provided by states with a deep interest in strategic stability on the Korean Peninsula would be necessary to assure the North Korean regime of its long-term survival and eventually normalization as a post-nuclear sovereign state. And third, importantly, reunification with the South remains its formal long-term objective albeit under the aegis of an Austro-Hungarian style confederacy, uniting two nations and social systems under one state with the goal of eventual long-term integration. In fact, a formal North Korean proposal widely ignored in the West proposes a democratic confederal republic of Koryo, as you know, the ancient name for one of the three Korean kingdoms. So what's the ROK, the Republic of Korea's formal position on these matters? South Korea has made it clear that its near-term concern is the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and that its concerns about the security of the ROK are growing under Kim Jong-un. President Park has stated the DPRK's most recent nuclear test, that is last month's, uh, is that we therefore no longer can have business as usual in terms of talks and sanctions which have little effect. She noted, and I quote, the patience of our side and that of the international community has already reached its limit. Unquote. In response to the DPRK's actions, the ROK has taken new steps to bolster its defences in a sign that it no longer views uh, the status quo as acceptable. This includes taking steps to repair its relationship with Japan and enhance trilateral US ROK Japan coordination, as well as agreeing to the deployment of an anti ballistic missile theatre defence system, or THAAD, Terminal High Altitude Area Defence, to the ROK. Japan, for its part, obviously has condemned the DPRK's latest tests at the United Nations General Assembly meetings on September 21, just last month, stating that the DPRK's latest missile and nuclear tests had, quote, changed the landscape completely, unquote. Abe further noted that the threat has now reached a dimension altogether different from what has transpired until now. Abe continued, we must therefore respond to this in a manner entirely distinct from our responses thus far, unquote. These sentiments echo those expressed in the United States. Following the DPRK's most recent nuclear test, President Obama reaffirmed the US position when he said, the US does not and will never accept North Korea as a nuclear state, and noted the US would work with its partners to take additional significant steps to bring a resolution to the North Korean problem. Meanwhile, there are growing conversations behind closed doors in Washington among US experts and former administration officials that the current policy of, quote, strategic patience, unquote, in dealing with the DPRK has not paid off. As one said recently, strategic patience as a policy is a clear failure. Virtually everyone I ask outside of government believes strategic patience is only worsening conditions on the peninsula. An alternative is radically required. Russia also has a deep interest in the long-term security of the Korean peninsula. It has supported all UNSC uh, resolutions to date, including sanctions regimes. But it has expressed reluctance to pursue additional sanctions, and it has expressed deep concerns about the implications of THAAD for the Korean Peninsula. Instead, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has expressed a preference for a return to the six-party talks, noting that he believes it is too early to bury the six-party talks, which should be resumed as soon as possible. <coughs> We've also seen increasing concern in Beijing about the acceleration of the DPRK's program. Following the September test, Chinese Vice Prime Minister Zhang Yesui urged North Korea, quote, not to take any more actions that could exacerbate tensions and to return as soon as possible to the correct direction of denuclearization, unquote. Like, Chi like Russia, China also calls for a return to the six-party talks. On 9 March 2016, Foreign Minister Wang Yi 
said at a press conference that Resolution <coughs> 2270 of the United Nations Security Council does not just contain sanctions, it also reiterates support for the six-party talks and asks the parties to refrain from taking actions that might aggravate tensions. He stressed that maintaining stability is the pressing priority and only negotiation can lead to a fundamental solution. During his meetings with President Obama on the margins of the most recent General Assembly, President Li Keqiang <coughs> noted that China's support, that China supported efforts of the UN Security Council to take further steps to respond to the DPRK's latest nuclear test. However, he also urged all parties to avoid actions that could escalate tensions, noting in particular China's continued objection to the US deployment of THAAD in support of the ROK. So what are the national positions on THAAD? worth thinking about for a bit, because this is where the rubber is currently hitting the road. Indeed, one of the most significant and divisive outcomes of the recent acceleration of DPRK nuclear and missile tests has been the agreement by the ROK and the US to deploy THAAD to the Korean Peninsula. From the perspective of the United States and their allies in the ROK and Japan, this system is necessary to defend against a growing missile threat that could leave millions of citizens potentially exposed to DPRK missiles, with very little warning. As Secretary of Defence Ash Carter noted in a speech at the Council of Foreign Relations in April of this year, it's a necessary thing. It's between us and South Korea. It's about protecting our own forces on the Korean Peninsula and about protecting South Korea. It has nothing to do with the Chinese, unquote. Carter said, unquote, or quote, we need to defend our own people, we need to defend our own allies, unquote. Japan has also extended diplomatic support for the THAAD deployment in South Korea. China's concern is that placement of a THAAD battery on the Korean Peninsula is also potentially targeted at China's strategic nuclear capabilities, as much as it is at DPRK capabilities, and that expanded US regional missile defense capability will deplete China's second strike uh, capacity, therefore undermining its own nuclear deterrent against the United States. President Xi underlined his position to the THAAD, his opposition to the THAAD deployment when meeting with the ROK's President Park during the G20 summit most recently in Hangzhou, only last month. While meeting with President Park, she stressed that mishandling the issue is not conducive to strategic stability in the region and could intensify disputes. In the first meeting between high-level officials from the governments of China and South Korea, since South Korea and the US announced that they were deploying THAAD, Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, publicly called for the ROK to quote, correct, unquote, their decision. In other words, this is not a normal statement of diplomatic disapproval. It's a formal call for a change in ROK policy. The Chinese ambassador to South Korea, Chiu Guo Hong, laid out the Chinese perspective bluntly, warning that the THAAD deployment, quote, would break the strategic balance in the region and create a vicious cycle of Cold War style confrontations and an arms race which could escalate tensions, unquote. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi expressed similar views, and I quote him, the THAAD system has far exceeded the need for defense in the Korean Peninsula and will undermine the security interests of Russia and China, shatter the regional strategic balance and trigger an arms race, unquote. These are not normal statements. These are strong statements. Hence why I've chosen to address this subject this evening. New things are happening, and they are of fundamental national security consequence to us all. The THAAD deployment has also become a contentious issue within South Korean domestic politics. Domestic political opinion over THAAD is evenly split in South Korea. In one survey, 42% of respondents answered that the deployment would aid the national interest by raising military deterrence against North Korea and strengthening the US-Korea alliance, while 45.8% believed it would hinder the national interest by reducing military effectiveness and aggravating conflict with China and Russia." Unquote. Vocal domestic protests against THAAD have broken out in parts of South Korea. The domestic debate has become so polarised that President Park has labelled THAAD opponents as pro-North Korean, unquote. Nothing worse can be said against a South Korean politician than to be described as pro-North Korean. However, the DPRK's continued missile tests and latest nuclear tests appear to have cemented the ROK's leadership and, if anything, accelerated the likely timeline for its, its deployment to the peninsula. Given all the above, is there a way forward? This leads to the perennial question put by someone at an earlier time in the history of the 20th century, what is to be done? 
Is there anything the US and China could do to stop the DPRK weapons program and eliminate its existing arsenal? For me, this is the core question of international relations in the Asia-Pacific hemisphere for the decade ahead. The prospects are not good, given that the DPRK is pursuing a strategic policy setting first laid down in 1993, arguably beforehand, when the DPRK, fearing the impact of the collapse of the Soviet <coughs> Union on its national defence and the political future of its own regime, saw through AQ Khan of Pakistan to obtain a fully-fledged independent nuclear capability. Furthermore, the facts on the, on the ground, or the interpretation thereof, are not universally agreed between Moscow, Washington and Beijing in terms of the current levels of capabilities. <coughs> that I've concluded from having spoken with experts in Washington, Beijing and Moscow. You'll hear different answers to the same factual questions in different capitals. These are on technical questions. Number of missiles, rate of development, sort of fissile, mat sort of fissile, fissile materials being deployed, as well as the hardening of nuclear sites. As I said recently in a speech in Moscow, a shared factual basis for a common strategy on how to manage security and stability on the Korean Peninsula is plainly lacking. If so, a joint assessment of the technical facts may potentially be useful. A more profound strategic disagreement concerns the more complex question of how much risk is tolerable. There is no objective answer to this question since it concerns varying red lines, national interests and strategic cultures. Where some states perceive a grave if not mortal threat in a nuclear armed North Korea, others are less concerned, or if they are concerned, the emphasis is on the risk of regime collapse, refugee outflow and nuclear proliferation to non-state actors. In addition, there's a concern that a nuclear power in Pyongyang could increase pressure on its Asian neighbouring states to develop an independent nuclear breakout capability that is, in either Korea or Japan, as they sought to secure their futures independently. There is also the complex question of the strategic implications of Korean unification, particularly as seen from Beijing and Moscow, since a unified Korea could result in their perception in a US ally on their geographical doorstep and possibly with US troops still deployed on its soil. This adds to the mesh of entangled interests and entangled issues. But a core question for all parties is to ask the deep questions. If you were Korean and Japanese now, what would you do to protect your national security in the face of North Korea's nuclear capabilities and the nature and content of DPRK declaratory policy on the actual use of nuclear weapons? For the future, I see five sort of scenarios. Number one, maintain the status quo. This means doing nothing often the safest recourse of bureaucrats that I have known across the world, in my jurisdiction and in others. Using the same policy settings of sanctions and efforts to bring the DPRK back to the negotiating table. It also means allowing the DPRK to continue to proceed apace, however, with its nuclear testing. While hoping, and more accurately, praying, it does not succeed in developing a viable warhead. It means, in short, staying on the train tracks to hell, in my view since North Korea has no intention of giving up its nuclear weapons and ballistic missile programs, and the US, South Korea and Japan have no intention of allowing the DPRK to succeed in obtaining that sort of <coughs> capability. I think we all would agree that this approach is outright folly. We all know Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing repeatedly while expecting a different result. Scenario two, further sanctions. This is perhaps the most likely scenario but there also appears to be a growing consensus that is the least likely to be effective based on the experience of now nearly two decades. Whoever wins the US presidential election, whoever she is this year, uh, <laughs> may well be tempted to increase sanctions, to increase the pressure on the regime based on the same theoretical formula we have seen and been relying upon for decades. Economic sanctions plus diplomatic isolation plus a return to the six party talks equals a negotiated outcome. We know objectively from the experience of the last two decades, this has just not happened. And so we can reasonably uh, presume that under the same conditions, let alone worse conditions, the same policy will not change the situation in the future. We know this script, we know where it leads to, which is nowhere. And we don't know, what we don't know is how much longer we can keep recycling it before a dramatic catalyst changes facts on the ground. Scenario three, back to the six party talks. 
There is certainly a hope in some quarters that diplomacy could resume through the six-party talks. The real issue here is the preconditions that all parties, especially the DPRK and the United States, feel would be needed before coming to the table and whether there can be any agreement on those preconditions that would satisfy all the parties. Various parties' preconditions have changed and evolved, have been diluted and bolstered at various points. In 2011, the US announced the precondition that the DPRK should cease nuclear and missile tests for negotiations to resume. China has supported an unconditional return to the six-party talks. Japan and Russia have been open on this question. North Korea will only return to the talks if there are no preconditions. But the US has refused to return to the negotiating table without a concrete signal of good faith emanating from the DPRK. Over time, however, the strength of US insistence on preconditions has waxed and waned. But in the short term, a resumption of the six-party talks is highly unlikely, short of a major initiative by the North Koreans in order to bring the Americans to the table. Scenario four, full bilateral negotiations pinned in the US and the DPRK. The US has expressed a willingness to consider this option, but has stated quite bluntly that they do not feel they have a willing partner in the DPRK. Between July 2011 and February 12, and many people have forgotten this, the Obama administration participated in three rounds of direct negotiations with North Korea. These talks, the last of which were held in Beijing, culminated in the hopeful but short-lived 29 February Leap Day Agreement. Optimism was palpable. At the North Korean embassy in Beijing, where American negotiators were greeted with Starbucks coffee on, on their arrival during the last days of negotiation. When the Starbucks comes, you know they're serious. The State Department announced on 29 February 2012 that North Korea had agreed to implement a moratorium on long-range missile launches, nuclear tests and nuclear activities at Yongbyon, including uranium enrichment activities. In exchange, the United States was willing to deliver 240,000 metric tonnes of nutritional assistance, with a prospect of additional assistance based on continued need, assuming North Korea complied. The agreement was short-lived. Direct talks were suspended following the North Korean missile tests in December 12 and the subsequent nuclear test in early 2013. A legacy of reneged uh, agreements by the North and residual mistrust flowing from that make any repeat of the Leap Day Agreement extremely likely for the foreseeable future. Secretary Clinton also has direct experience of these negotiations with the DPRK during this period. She was Secretary of State. She knows full well the pitfalls of negotiating agreements with the DPRK only to have them dishonoured. And how easily breakthroughs can therefore blow up into diplomatic failures and domestic political liabilities of being accused of being soft on North Korea. It is safe to assume that a US <coughs> President Hillary Clinton would not pursue such a policy of direct negotiation on the road to bilateral normalisation with the North. As noted earlier in my remarks, the DPRK has pushed for bilateral normalisation with the US, including demands for a peace treaty. And the US has rejected such talks in the absence of meaningful progress on denuclearization. This scenario then, short of an unpredictable policy reversal on one or both sides, is unlikely for the, sh for the short term. So, so what's scenario five? Um, conflict and war. Uh, it's important to think clearly about the dangers of another war on the Korean Peninsula and its enormous cost to concentrate the mind on what is at stake here. Many analysts have openly, sometimes recklessly, thrown military scenarios out into the public domain on this. Uh, one such uh, scenario was produced in May of 2016 by a US-based geopolitical consultancy. It said, in a surprise attack scenario, this is a US preemptive strike, the primary tools for the task will be stealth aircraft and standoff cruise missiles launched from ships and submarines. Given enough time, the US could assemble upward of 10 B-2 bombers for a deep strike into North Korea using airfields in Japan and South Korea and operating under a highly restrictive operational security environment, the US Air Force could probably deploy 24 F-22 aircraft for the mission. With a force of 10 Massenov Ordnance Penetrators and 80 900 kilogram GBU-31 JDAMs, the report claims, the US B-2 bombers alone are more than enough to dismantle or at least severely damage North Korea's known nuclear production infrastructure, as well as associated nuclear weapons storage sites. In terms of the day after, the same report goes on to say the partial destruction of Seoul by conventional North Korean artillery, quote, if every one of Pyongyang's 300 mm multiple rocket launcher systems were directed against Seoul, which they currently are, their range would be sufficient to rain fire across the city and beyond. 
A single volley could deliver more than 350 metric tonnes of explosives across the South Korean capital, roughly the same amount of ordnance dropped by 1152 bombers. More than a thousand ballistic missiles could also then strike South Korea more broadly. Ballistic missiles could also strike US military positions beyond the Korean peninsula, specifically in Japan. And because of the inaccuracy of North Korean missile target systems, um, then North Korean uh, missiles uh, could strike civilian areas around US bases in the region. And finally, last but not least, the DPRK could respond with one to five nuclear weapons lobbed at solved itself by whatever crude device it had. Even if this is a low probability risk on technological grounds, <coughs> it weighs heavily on US and allied contingency planning. I call all that the Dr. Strange love option. Um, and uh, it, it is, however, the subject of some emerging literature in the United States. Is there then a role for second track diplomacy in dealing with this challenge? Any negotiated diplomatic solution to the uh, North Korean nuclear and ballistic missile issues are in the hands, of course, of the national governments concerned. They, and specifically their leaders and policy elites, carry a heavy burden of responsibility for the future of the Korean Peninsula and the broader peace and stability of Asia. Because this is ultimately about North Korea um, and, of course, through it, the security of Northeast Asia, it is a challenge to be taken seriously. Multilateral institutions, especially the United Nations, have a role to play. So far, they have not. The Korean War occurred under the auspices of UN Security Council Resolution UNSC 84 of 1950. The UN therefore remains relevant today. Thus far, however, there has been no UN special mission. In my argument, there needs to be. At a regional level, the ASEAN Regional Forum too may have a modest role to play as the only regional security forum which the DPRK is a member of. And uh, beyond that, there are of course other possibilities as well, including initiatives by non-governmental actors. Perhaps there is some role here. A number of such processes are already underway today, despite the setbacks. The value of such initiatives lie in bridge building with a range of new players within the DPRK regime. This is a new regime with new personnel. We've seen that in terms of Kim Jong-un's handling of the leadership elite around him. What are the dynamics driving the regime? Or whether there's any interest within the regime in any off-ramp from the current railway tracks, as I've said before, which I argue are leading to hell? Or whether there is zero real interest at all? Or what baseline interests would need to be met in order to avoid this apocalyptic scenario? Can second track diplomacy work to test the conditions under which, first, under which first track diplomacy is possible or not? This was the formula followed by the Oslo Peace Accords, where you had early work um, at a second track level. It's also the approach adopted, adopted for many years over the Aceh settlement in Indonesia, and most recently with the Iranian nuclear negotiations before they began formally. On balance, given the stakes, I've got to confess I'm sceptical about any real prospects of success for any such an approach with the DPRK. Many have failed in the past in such efforts. This may well be the case in the future. But in Churchill's great aphorism, it is still always better to jaw-jaw than to war-war, and we need someone to be doing that. To conclude on future action, I'm concerned about us drifting slowly towards crisis, conflict, and even all-out war. Crazier things have happened in international relations. De Minera, I'm concerned about the emerging black hole uh, in terms of our deep lack of understanding about the nature, culture and key personalities of the new DPRK regime. The precise formula of any possible solution to the North Korean nuclear question evidently depends on the parties themselves, on their definition of their own interests and on the compromises to these interests which would occur within negotiations. I'm not in the business of telling governments what their national interests should be. The specifics of any final agreement are matters for states concerned. Short of prescribing an imaginary negotiated solution, which I think at this stage would be a fool's errand, there are, however, some intermediate steps which may help. One possible approach involves a strategy of what is called graduated reciprocity uh, in tension reduction. Only the Americans could come up with a term such as that. Its acronym is GRIT. Graduated Reciprocity and Tension Reduction. This strategy of GRIT uh, was first conceived and employed during the Cold War. It consists of each party making a series of unilateral gestures of goodwill, beginning with small symbolic gestures to decrease tensions unilaterally. If the other party reciprocates with a similar move, the cycle can continue incrementally 
with incrementally larger and larger steps until finally a crisis has de-escalated to the point where meaningful negotiations can occur. But, but where to begin and with whom? Experts on this strategy suggest that the more powerful party should make the first gesture of goodwill because they are likely to feel less existentially threatened than the other. Given the combined military, political and economic weight of the United States and its two allies, uh, relative to North Korea, it may make sense for Washington to send the first signal, however small, and wait for a North Korean reciprocal gesture. There may be no reciprocated measure by the DPRK at all. In fact, that is my deep fear and suspicion. Or the DPRK may simply, as they've done with the international community for decades, string people along by strategic time in order to complete their nuclear program. But if such actions were contemplated by the US, it would not involve public diplomatic activity. It would involve operational decisions in the absence of public diplomatic and political commentary. Such an approach could be advised to the Chinese and the Russians. They in turn could communicate it through their own channels in Pyongyang. And if it was then met with cold, stony silence and an absence of reciprocal actions from the North, it has the advantage of demonstrating to Moscow and Beijing that a peaceful strategy has been tried. Once again, this is all about creating the conditions necessary for negotiations. It is not about the content or outcome of negotiations themselves. China in particular may well be placed to signal, even if it cannot ensure, that the North Korean government subscribes to the logic of this strategy of gradual tension reduction. Even if China cannot be an impartial arbiter, for obvious historical and strategic reasons, it can at least serve to dampen North Korean fears and encourage confidence in a resumption of negotiations. China has a lot to gain from a peaceful negotiated solution on the North Korean nuclear question. Besides preserving geopolitical stability on its doorstep and preventing a collapse and a possible humanitarian crisis, China and Russia would like to see the logic underpinning South Korea's deployment of THAAD annulled. And it could only be annulled if the threat against which THAAD is directed was removed. If the conditions for substantive negotiations did occur, and again, I'm skeptical, then it would be important for China to deploy new leverage in Pyongyang, particularly in terms of its economic and its energy relationships. And on the final content of negotiations, the hard issues are then on the table to resolve. Diplomatic recognition, a peace treaty, a long-term compact for Korean national unity, foreign investment in North Korea, humanitarian supplies, and most critically, cancellation of the North Korean nuclear weapons program, the abolition of its vast arsenal, and satisfactory verification of all the above. Again, I'm skeptical. But these three steps that I've outlined, first, using second-track diplomacy to build bridges with the new personnel in the regime. Second, experimentation with a strategy of strategic symmetry, similar to the approach of graduated reciprocity and tension reduction, or GRIT. And third, policy planners in Beijing and elsewhere, I hope, in the United States, adopting the approach of working together on the nature of a final agreement, including the core elements that I've referred to above. The alternative to such approach is increasingly clear and governed by a core and I think very dark strategic logic. One, that the DPRK will not stop in acquiring a nuclear weapons capability to threaten the US, Japan and South Korea as, it only means, uh, as its only means to guarantee its own regime's survival. Second, the US, Japan and Korea will not accept the DPRK as a responsible nuclear power under any circumstances, given the history of the regime's strategic behaviour and its belligerent declaratory policy on nuclear weapons use. And third, South Korea and perhaps Japan will deploy THAAD as a rational response to North Korea's real nuclear threat, as the only alternative to immediately acquiring their own nuclear weapons capabilities as independent national deterrents were they to lose confidence in the strategic guarantees of the US nuclear umbrella. Fourth, THAAD will result in an enhancement of China's strategic nuclear rocket forces, or a PAL, to ensure the survivability of its <laughs> nuclear deterrent in the case of a first strike, and in turn setting off chain reactions and other nuclear capitals as a tactical nuclear problem on the Korean Peninsula becomes a strategic nuclear problem more broadly. And finally, the likelihood that no US president will tolerate in the absence of military action the development of a North Korean ICBM capacity with a miniaturised warhead that could threaten the continental United States. So my core argument is that based on these strategic realities, if the DPRK is prepared to negotiate away its nuclear capability, everything else the regime is interested, is on the ta- interested in is on the table. If not, we're on the way to crisis, conflict, and I hate to say it, 
the possibility of war. Because then we are simply staring at the inevitable policy response to a measurable technical timetable vis-a-vis -vis the DPRK's nuclear weapons and ballistic missile thresholds. I argue in conclusion, the future of US-China relations hangs on this. I thank you for your attention.